John, welcome to A House for Arts. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you, thank you. I'm so tickled to be on your show. I really am. Oh my am. gosh, you're tickled. That's a very British thing to say, right? Yes, I have a lot of affectations, as Wonderful. will become obvious in a minute here. Wonderful. Well, we'll talk a little <laughs> more about that in a minute, but I did want to give kind of a more formal opening for you and this book that you've written. Um, I know this looks bad. So here it is. So in his new book, I Know This Looks Bad, Albany native and Saratoga Springs resident J.P.V. Oliver Gent recounts academic disaster and dodgy foreign entanglements, tells of long-held secrets, hobnobs with His Royal Highness Prince Philip, describes hilarious corporate misadventures, and delivers a few poignant family tributes along the way. This sounds like an incredible opening for your book. <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about I Know This Looks Bad. There, uh, it's in the, in the biography business, it's what's called a modular memoir, which means there's 365 entries uh, that are epigrams. And, and uh, epigrams, are they, they're sort of like pithy sayings yeah, that, well, they're that kind short, of send right? an so idea. Herodotus and Catullus and Washington Irving all wrote in epigrams because it's a few words to make a big point. Now, okay. you're, you're an art person, right? So think of the Chuck Close um, uh, photorealist guy, right? So when you're up close to Chuck Close's yes. work, right, yeah. you see a little cube. Right. But you step back, you know, six feet, and oh my God, there's Chuck Close's face. Right. And right. so this book is a little bit, well, the readers get to decide whether I succeeded, but that's the idea. So it's a literary form of something like that painted portrait exactly right. made up of these little parts, yeah. and you pan out to look at something much larger. Exactly right. Would you mind reading from one oh, of sure. these epigrams? Oh, sure, happy to do that. I'm pretty familiar with this copy, I've got to be honest. Just pretty familiar. That's good. Not entirely. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is called uh, a Lake, Lake George October. In their 60 years in Lake George, New York, my relatives owned three big resorts, three restaurants, two bars, and a bookshop. If you've been to that village, and who hasn't, you know the word resort has an imprecise term, is an imprecise term. These places feature wooden Adirondack chairs, each a gaudy green, and each heavier than the Great Pyramid of Giza. They had arms you could land a plane on. When I was eight, my cousin Vincent gutted a newly caught trout on just such a platform, his beer and ham sandwich undisturbed on the other arm. One sunny October Sunday, we played touch football just like a famous family of that time. A month later, in the TV room, we watched a dignified military funeral for the murdered leader of that family. For a little boy, it was all magical. Amazing. I love this. And you know, what I'm paying attention to is as, as I'm hearing you read this epigram is the importance of tone and voice in creating right. a story. Right. So tell us a bit about how you came up with the voice for this, for you or for this character yeah. that is telling the story. Um, the purpose of, of, of the writing is to, is to look at the world in a kind of a wry way uh, and with humor that pierces but does not wound, hmm. right? And Tell so, us a bit about that. What does that mean to pierce but not wound? There's a great uh, novelist people may have heard of called Peter DeVries, and he wrote these novels which, which gently mocked Westchester County and Fairfield County and the pretensions and the affectations. But it was said of him, his, his humor pierced but not, not wounded. So, so it's funny and it mocks, but gently. It's, it's not being, it's not mean-spirited to anybody. Mm -hmm. And so the reader can come away with, yeah, that's not a, that's not a bad idea. That's not a, a bad way to think of this or that. Why is it so important to kind of have that wry approach to telling something about life or a story without necessarily like really hurting people or hurting readers? Yeah, because I think everybody appreciates on one level that our existence is absurd, you know, in mm -hmm. some way, right? And so to get through it, um, you know, we adapt humor and we, we, you know, we find ways to cope. And I've always found that this, this sort of gentle, um, amused look at the world is not the worst way to go. Right, and giving it in these sort of smaller sound bites, if you will, or these smaller epigrams, what gave you the idea to use that kind of format rather than saying like long form prose for a memoir? Yeah, um, I, I don't have the powers of invention to, to be a, a novelist, so I had to, to find something e easier. I don't have much of an attention span, so this works really, really. Does anybody now have an attention span? Well, yes, the, look, some, <laughs> your viewers do, I'm sure. And they will lose, they, by the way, they will lose IQ points reading this book, but they have so many of them that it's not, they won't even notice, it'll be fine. So, so tell us then about um, the, the photographs that you have interspersed in the book. Um, the photographs, 
uh, uh, act as the anchor to these little stories, right? So they enhance or in some place contradict the, the point of the story. Let me give you an example. Uh, the April uh, 2nd entry is about Charlemagne, right? And so the, here's this picture of Charlemagne and he's got his grand scepter and he's got his crown. The great king and, or the great leader, right? right Charlemagne, exactly right, yes. right. And uh, he's in medieval, brought Christianity to the medieval world and he's got his robes on and he's, he's dignified, but his eyes are like, like, what are we doing, fellas? What, what is this? <laughs> And so, you know, so it's, it's a, a little poke in the ribs from Charlemagne. Right. Taking something that you would expect and then sort of twisting it or giving a little surprise That's right. at yeah. the end. Yeah, exactly right. 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 So I, you also have a background, too, as a speechwriter for Seagram and GE. I do, yeah. And I'm curious to know, and I'm guessing these are some of the corporate misadventures that you talk about um, in, in the book, but do you think that that ever had an impact on your inspiration or your method of writing? I know this looks bad later on. A absolutely, because what you learn early on is if you don't, if you're not able to entertain an audience, forget the content. If you can't hold their attention, then Mr. or Ms. Big, for whom you've written the speech, is gonna be very, very unhappy and you're gonna be out of work very quickly. So you have to have uh, prose that's compelling uh, and you have to tell a story that people can connect to, right? The best. Mm -hmm. A bit of advice I ever got about writing was make sure you're able to connect with the reader. If your stuff is wonderful, that's great, but if it doesn't, if people don't connect to it, then they right. won't stay with you. And by connecting, John, do you mean that people should be able to see something of themselves in the character that you write? I gave an interview to a, a Connecticut paper, paper a couple of weeks ago, and the first words out of the reporter's mouth were, well, tell me about your, uh, your process as a writer. And I was like, M uh, uh, what, my what? Uh, oh, oh, my process, well, but there really is one, and, and it is this. Uh, everybody was a child. Everybody knows the feeling of being, hmm. you know, sort of not sure in the world and, you know, the joys and fears that come with being a child. So a lot of, some of these pieces uh, tap into that, that concept. Right, and you write about being a child in this. Yeah. Um, do these go in chronological order? I'm just curious. Mm -mm. No, it's all over the place. All over the place, yeah. but 365 to make sure you have one for every day of the year. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. What's a, a story or a memory from your childhood that you think is really memorable from your from your book? Uh, <laughs> my, uh, one time my, we lived in a house uh, in West Albany, New York, um, uh, and that was my, the Oliver ancestral home. And one day my father came in and he said, we're getting, we're getting aluminum, aluminum siding. And I said, oh, great. It's a bright Pepto-Bismol Pepto pink siding. My father had a beer distributorship and he gave the guy 300 cases of cheap beer to get siding for free. Amazing. And forever after we called that house the Pink Palace and it had more kitsch and it had a player piano and it had an up, <laughs> above ground pool. And it, it was a palace to him. And right. it really was. It was charming the way he loved that place. Right. And, so, and you would never forget which one was your home. No, indeed. Right. No, right. that's and, really good, too. Yeah. And, yeah. and planes used to navigate when they landed at Albany Airport. They would navigate on that house. Based on the aluminum siding. Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. That's So what other pieces of advice would you have for emerging writers who really want to create not just a great memoir, but a really great story? Um, what I've seen over the years is people, and I'm guilty of this myself, uh, assume that the reader is as blown away and, and beguiled by what you've written as you are. Hmm. And that's not fair. Your job as a writer is to entertain uh, the reader. If, let me put it this way. If you're reading a book and you feel like you're in harness, right, and you're dragging a, a plow through rocky soil, that's the author's problem, not yours. Hmm. The author's problem, the author's job is to entertain you and hold you, and then whatever the hell content it is, that's fine. Right. But his or her first job is to hold your attention. Right, to really pull you in right. and to make the reader feel like this is relatable. Right. This is something that really hooks exactly me in. Exactly right. Amazing. Well, John, thank you so much for sharing how about I Know This Looks Bad, and I can't wait to have a look at I Know This Looks Bad very soon. Thank you. I, I do want to say, uh, if for your viewers, if they think that you're charming and accomplished and wonderful, uh, on air, they should meet you in person. You're an extraordinarily gifted person. So it was thank been a, you been very a great much, pleasure John. Likewise, thank you so yeah, much. Cheers. <laughs> cheers.